Uh, it is 2.16, so we're gonna get started again. Um, we're gonna wait on um, Director Murphy to be with us as well as we look at her slides. There she is, hi. And um, uh, uh, just as a preliminary matter, and then I'll let others indicate preliminary matters, I had to do a lot of other things at lunch, and so I've not eaten lunch. So I'm gonna put my screen on no show me. I'm still listening and I will participate, but I'm gonna be um, eating tamales. So um, there you go. Um, Director Murphy, um, wow, that was a vigorous last discussion session, but I think that was very helpful. Um, do you wanna set the stage for where we are at this point? I do. I'm just kind of neurotically formatting a PowerPoint because I can't help myself. Um, we all have our own little versions of OCD. So where I see that we are at um, is to wrap up one other non 903D6 question. Um, I think that we got a lot of very good direction on some of the other provisions of 903. And so I would just kick it to you commissioners. Um, uh, to consider the question in 903E um, around aligning with CDPHE per Aurora EDF comments. And I don't have those comments committed to memory, so my ability to provide any more color on this topic is, uh, is, is limited. But um, with that, I would, I'll continue my like neurotic format, my slightly neurotic formatting real quick and let you all discuss the issue. Uh, commissioners, um, who brought this issue to the table? And maybe they can start. Commissioner Bogue. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm pretty sure that was me. Um, I think you had it written down too, but there was a suggestion from, yeah, EDF City of Aurora that I guess in AQCC's Reg 7, they have a requirement for a responsible official to sign a commitment to seek gas capture solutions. Um, I just wanted to have a more open dialogue about that. Perhaps Commissioner Putnam has some thoughts on it, but you know, is that added value here or not? Yes, I remember that now. Thank you, Commissioner Bogue. Commissioner Putnam, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, happy to weigh in on that subject. Um, under EPA regulations, submissions of uh, a number of permit materials have to be made by a responsible official, which usually means an executive vice president or vice president or above um, to comply with some of their enforcement and compliance rules. I I'm not sure whether that adds um, a whole lot of particular value. It's certainly not required under um, Oil and Gas Conservation Act. There is, I think, some benefit to it insofar as it focuses uh, attention from management and, um, you know, certainly points to a responsible individual if uh, things are significantly awry or fraudulent or other sort of uh, things. I'm not sure it needs to be tied to this specific issue and suggest it's more of a generalized conversation. I'm not sure I would do, we'd do it just for this as opposed to all the other submissions um, that operators make. And you know that has its own um, uh, set of operational considerations on that front, you know, one of the issues that we've had to work out during this pandemic was getting all those signatures done, um, you know, when we're scattered and working remotely, you know, posed a little bit of a challenge um, on that front. So um, I think my suggestion would be it's worth a generalized discussion about who the right point of contact would be. I'm not sure I see a particular need to do it in this rule series. Might I ask staff if it has opinions about whether such a requirement would solve a problem that is currently existent in terms of applications and certifications or not? AAG Minor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, staff certainly reviewed this suggestion from EDF as, as it reviewed all stakeholders' suggestions. Um, and, and did not think it solved a problem that needed to be solved here. Um, as Commissioner Putnam noted, this is more of a, a general matter and, and staff 
does have a, a general rule in, in the 200 series, our, our general series, regarding the designation of a principal agent. Um, so this is in Rule 205B1A, um, and the definition of principal agent was modified in this in the mission two through 600 cha mission change rulemaking. I think staff's position is that that serves sufficiently for our purposes to sort of identify um, who a contact point should be, you know, who we should go back to if there's an issue. Um, I'll, I'll just note that while COGCC doesn't operate as a sort of agency with delegated authority from EPA um, in Rule 903, we, we do in the 800 series. So when we demonstrate our equivalency to, to the EPA standards that also require CDPHG to you know, have a responsible official the rule we point to for that purpose is the principal agent rule. So I, I think that it essentially serves the same function um, as what is served at CDPHG with the responsible official designation. And I'm not sure that we really need to go beyond that current 200 series rule here from staff's perspective. Commissioner Bo. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks so much, AEG Minor. Um, that satisfies my question. I, I think it's fine as is. Me too. Everybody else comfortable with it? Okay. Um, moving on, I think we're at 903D6. You're correct, Chair. Um, I don't know if so, you want to put any finer points on it, but. Yeah. Um, maybe we could get this started um, if we could get, and, and staff probably did this in its opening, but just a refresher on how staff got to the two TPY and the five TPY and the, why there's a difference, et cetera, that might help inform the discussion. Um, sure, I'll take a first cut at that. And I would start with our current 805 rule, which applies um, a five TPY max for pits within 1,325 feet of a um, building unit. And in looking at that requirement and others, um, and considering that a number of other pieces of equipment do have emissions limits, and looking at our overarching mission to reduce emissions in particular, um, reduce and minimize, um, we looked at what we could be doing to accomplish that goal and um, thought that it made sense to um, extend and broaden the applicability of um, the reduced limitations in proximity to people um, and also broadly look at what we would want to see in the new design of pits going forward. And so that's the subpart B. So, um, sorry, I kind of started with 805 and then forgot to tell everybody that I moved into what staff was proposing in um, 903D6 and subpart A would be kind of an extension and a broadening of the applicability of the existing 805 standard. And by um, broadening, I mean applying it within 2000 feet of a building unit um, and also by changing the emissions limit from five to two. And then also the second part of 903D6B would create a statewide emissions limit for all pits going forward of five tons per year. Um, and these are VOC emissions in particular. So again, you know, we were looking at our charge to reduce impacts and these are two, two tools we have suggested as a way to limit emissions and again, kind of going back to the comments I made yesterday, there are existing in staff, in COGCC's rules, a number of emissions limits on a number of different pieces of equipment, um, pneumatics, um, glycol dehydrators, and we've pulled out a number of those emissions, a number of those emissions restrictions given that CDPHE regulates many of those. And instead we've chosen to focus on pit emissions, which we understand are an air arena in which CDPHE does not have emissions limits, though it is looking at emissions from pits in um, some of its permitting decisions. So 
I hope that provides a little bit of context of where we are um, when we look at the implementation of 903 D6 and C it gives a year to get information to staff um, about about the pit itself so that we can calculate what those emissions are um, and start you know moving forward towards implementation after that point in time um, I think with that if I I, I do want to flag for commissioners that um, Mr. Duranlo has had to, has a um, volunteer commitment this afternoon, so we've lost his expertise for the afternoon. But if AAG Minor or anybody else on the team want to chime in, um, I'd welcome comments. AAG Minor. Thank you, Mr. Cherry. I, I think the only thing I would add in, in response to sort of your specific question of how did we arrive at five and two. Um, Five tons per year is the standard in, in the current rule, and, and it's also the emission standard in the current rule for tanks and glycol dehydrators that, as Director Murphy mentioned, we've moved away from. And two seems like a reasonable lower threshold because that is the, as you heard from stakeholders, the emissions level at which if the same fluids were placed in a tank, that tank would be subject to control under the AQCC regulations. Um, and then finally, I, I think it, I, I can't underscore enough the importance of rule, proposed rule um, uh, 903 uh, uh, D6C, which requires the estimation of the methods, sorry, operators to explain how they are estimating their emissions. Current rule 805 B1C or B2C does not clearly require operators to tell staff how they are estimating their emissions in all cases. And so getting that report from operators about how they know what their emissions are, which is tied back to Rule 909J, it is, is really an important piece in how staff arrived at the, the proposed rule. Uh, one uh, clarification, uh, AAG Minor. Um, did you just say that the five tons per year is, is current rule? Yes, so so current, I mean, I can just read it for everyone. It, the, the five tons per year does not apply to all all tanks statewide, but the, the current current rule 805 um, B to capital C reads, pits with uncontrolled actual emissions of VOC of five TPY or greater shall not be located within 1,320 feet of a building unit or a designated outdoor activity area. For the purposes of this section, compliance with Rule 902C is required. Operators may provide site-specific data and analyses to COGCC staff establishing the pits potentially subject to this subsection do not have potential to emit VOC of 5 TPY or greater. Okay. Thank you. So I think that uh, the discussion here in particular, in my mind, is around the concerns raised by, in particular, West Slope operators with the large recycle and reuse water-related pits um, and sort of the tension of wanting to um, incentivize and allow for that which is an environmentally good thing to encourage. Uh, it also reduces truck traffic, um, which is what happens otherwise. It uses pipelines, et cetera, um, with the concern that was raised that as drafted, um, this rule would not allow new such pits and would uh, probably disallow the, the same pits from being able to be used going forward, um, if I have that right, um, in how to juggle these sorts of competing positive issues from this. Commissioner Messner. Looking for the mute button. There we go. Just looking for my looking for my <clears throat> cursor that, that's really challenging with two screens um 
So I'm just going to take a shot at this. And these are ideas, right? So I'm, I'm not hung up on any of these ideas. I'm just going to throw some things out there. I'm certainly open to thoughts and um, you know, criticism or other ideas. But you know, like I indicated yesterday, I think that water ends up becoming a really important conversation here, particularly on the Western Slope. Um, you know, I, I know that Mr. Doe doesn't think that I listen to him, but I do listen to him actually. And, you know, I think he made some pretty um, uh, good testimony yesterday or the day before, <clears throat> you know, about the Colorado water plan, the amount of water uh, acre feet that are gonna need to be found in order to meet our obligations and the volumes of water that inevitably are utilized by oil and gas operations. And so I think that, you know, we certainly are making efforts to try to encourage the reuse and recycling of water. Um, I think operators are making um, significant efforts to reuse and recycle water. <clears throat> and I wanna make sure that whatever we do, that we continue to encourage that and incentivize that. <clears throat> At the same time, I do understand that the uncontrolled emissions off of pits is a uh, is of concern particularly the vocs and so i'm trying to come up with some ideas on how these two things could potentially work together so i'll throw some ideas out there and i threw some of them out earlier but uh, you know i think that <clears throat> there's a potential here for 903d6 to tie into 9053 in the sense that um, there may be the possibility to create a default emissions um, requirement, whatever that may be, 2 TPY, 5 TPY. We could potentially, uh, you know, have a 2 TPY emissions cap for pits within 2,000 feet of buildings or uh, designated outdoor spaces in non-attainment areas, a 5 TPY um, in other areas with the potential for an additional allowance upon submission of a 9053 reuse and recycling plan that specifies, you know, the, the different elements that are included in 9053, um, but also makes commitments to the amount of water recycled, the um, utilization of the BEX technologies available to minimize emissions prior to the water being to start, discharged into the pit, um, and the utilization of pipeline infrastructure for distribution of that recycled water in lieu of uh, trucks. So those are my those are those are my ideas. <clears throat> Commissioner Messner, may I just clarify when you refer to 9053, I believe you're referring to 905A3. That is that is correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I just wanted to clarify one or two things about uh, the way that CDPHE looks at these. Um, first, for within the non-attainment area where VOCs are one of the two precursors we're most concerned about for ground level ozone, um, reasonably available control technology requirements apply um, if a facility is subject to a permit. So. Um, it, it doesn't have the same, there's not a cap uh, associated with it in the same way I think it was being proposed here, but there is um, a, a limitation based on technology, which is the kind of primary way that the Clean Air Act um, works. And so, um, you know, we do have models for this and at least on 6C, you know, my suggestion would be to make sure that whatever um, applicability or other sort of calculations are being done or being done in a consistent way so that the math is consistent as between what we require at Air Pollution Control Division 
um, and what um, COGCC may be doing here. Um, so I think that's uh, one clarification that I wanted to get out of the way. And then secondly, I think it's important to know that uh, based on those technology limits, you know, there isn't going to be a necessarily a two ton cap um, on tanks either. It applies technology, which is, is going to be capture and destruction um, and lead to a somewhat different number um, associated with the ultimate uh, outcome. So, and I don't think that the tanks are limited to uncontrolled emissions of greater than two tons. You can have bigger tanks. It's really focusing on making sure the technology um, is going to control. And our two ton per year limit is really a control requirement or a permitting point requirement, not necessarily a kind of prohibition uh, of storage volumes. And that's where I think some of the points that were made yesterday about the sheer volume of water being dealt with in some of those centralized facilities on the West Slope, um, outside of the non-attainment area, give me pause in understanding the full consequences of what this will mean um, from a practical applicability perspective. And so I'm more nervous, I think, about the retroactive application without fully understanding um, you know, all of the consequences um, of this. I think moving forward, I'm less concerned under the assumption, and AAG Minor can correct me if I'm wrong, that if someone has a compelling case, they can seek a, a variance. Um, although I think Commissioner Messner's tie into the reuse and recycling plan um, would make sense. But as a Generalized rule, I think, especially for dealing with some of the existing facilities that are going to be out there, I think some additional study of those particular consequent uh, uh, facilities and the consequences of um, retroactive application would make sense because, in addition to some of the water related considerations that Commissioner Messner mentioned, um, I am concerned about increased truck trips, um, which lead to um, various serious pollutant concerns as well, as well as safety issues of just having more trucks on roads driving around that may or may not be providing a comparable environmental benefit. So um, I think that's a place where my suggestion would be that we, um, you know, bring this back to staff and some of the stakeholders take another hard look um, that at that issue. Um, I, I'm not sure I fully understand the consequences moving forward based on the way that it's written today. So it's hard for me to say um, that all of this makes sense, although I think some of it would. And certainly the general thrust of it that we do want to keep reducing emissions is the right approach. And for those things that can be run through tanks and controlled, especially in the front range non-attainment area, we certainly want to do that. Um, I'm just not sure, especially with some of the bigger Western Slope water recycling, what the bigger environmental benefit would be. Um, and so I think we'd need to understand that before making a rec recommendation one way or the other. And uh, AAG Manor, maybe you could clarify whether the um, variance provisions in the 500 series, I think it's 502, would apply for um, some of those existing facilities that um, you know may not be able to come into compliance. AG Minor. Yes, Commissioner Putnam. Rule five hundred two would apply um, as it does in all of the commission's rules. So operators would have the ability to seek a variance. Commissioner McGowan. Just to clarify for myself in this discussion of truck traffic, the, the, the water is getting to the pit in the first place via trucks, correct? AAG Minor. Maybe we can have um, Mr. Axelson, who I, I just realized is not here, um, or, or Dr. Gintaudis answer. Um, but I, I believe that the water is actually coming directly out of the well and, and sort of piped directly yeah, into, into the pipe. Pit. Yeah, and, and my, yeah, my recollection, piped. my recollection of our tour that we took on the west slope was that there are significant water pipes 
and then beside them, you know, so that it goes back and forth via um, pipe and not truck. And it uh, looks like John Axelson, who probably knows this better than my um, surmising, is joining us. So let's give him a second to join. Well, he joined, I would just acknowledge it. He does most of his work on the Eastern Plains and we probably don't have the right environmental person on the call right now. But my understanding- Mike Leonard is showing up. Mike Leonard would be a good one, but my consistent, my understanding is that it is a piped system. I mean, that's one of the really unique and um, positive features of the Piance Basin development is the pr produced water network and the water sharing agreements among operators. Mr. Leonard, Hello. Mr. Axelson. Um, yeah, uh, Director Murphy's correct. They, they they pipe the vast majority of the water over there. Mr. Chair, if I may, we are also adding um, Alex uh, Fisher, um, yes. who is the uh, West Slope Supervisor for the Environmental Unit, um, Mr. Axelson's counterpart on the Western Slope. So he is now part of the Zebra panel. See, look how powerful you are, Commissioner McGowan. You ask one question and then a swoop of scientific experts show up to answer your question. Especially when my assumption is incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> so this is um, Alex Fisher and that is correct. Uh, that uh, um, the fluids are piped and combination of piping and trucking. Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> While we have the experts here, I, I do have a few other questions uh, about this. So, I mean, I think truck traffic comes in a number of different ways, and I understand we're talking about the Western Slope. There's also, you know, other operations around the state that potentially use recycled water or fresh water for that matter. <clears throat> and when it comes to the utilization of fresh water in operations that utilize the water for fracking that depending on where you're on the state that's either piped in or potentially trucked in as well is that correct mike mr leonard you might be best suited to answer this kind of with a statewide vision but it is a combination of trucks and pipes to get to move water around I'm trying to get my things working here um that's correct it it, it does uh, it does really depend on where you're at. Um, uh, a lot of the water on the, on the, um, especially on the Western Slope, a lot of that water is piped around. Uh, they actually lay lines to, they'll lay a line uh, from a, we call them frack pads. So they'll, they'll frack multiple, multiple pads from one place and they lay lines from that pad to those other pads. <clears throat> and then when they're done with those, they turn those, they, they turn it back around the other way and, and pump that water, that flowback water, right back through that same piping. Um, the, in, in the DJ Basin, they use um, um, light, what they call it lay flat hose. So uh, you, you hook it together and then it's soft and then it expands to like 10 inch diameter. They pump water around that way. Um, there are places though that, that they, they have to truck it because it's just either such a distance or you know, there's, there's um, um, subdivisions in the way or things like that. So it, it's a multiple mul multitude of methods. Right. But ultimately there's, there's certainly benefits to, you know, recycling that water and minimizing that truck traffic, right? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'll just, weigh in. Um, John, I would, or Commissioner Messner, I was going in a similar direction to you. Um, I heard enough evidence testimony. I think this is a classic example that one size doesn't fit all. And I think this is a classic example that we should recognize the distinctions between the DJ Basin, um, where they truck a lot of their reused water and the Peons Basin um, and I think that we should be doing things to encourage and incentivize the reuse of water. And so I was going to go down some path of creating an exception to uh, 906, 90, 
three, D, six, A, and B for those um, large facilities that are dealing with produced water and that are um, doing recycling and reuse of water. And I was gonna suggest that we allow them to not have to meet either of the five or the two threshold. And instead of working on a threshold for those, those things require you know, some sort of best management plan. Um, I didn't think about the um, 905A3, that that might be a good way of doing that. Um, I also was gonna suggest that we require periodically, every six months, every year, an affirmative showing of historic water reuse and recycle, maybe the volumes of the water that's reused and recycled, the number of trucks that are off the road, the sort of pro-con environmental net benefits, and I'm making some of this up as I go, but I wanted to be able to show that if you're getting a pass from meeting those standards, we're getting a net benefit from that. Um, and then I would suggest that if there's going to be a new pit that's proposed for you know, for produced water reuse and recycle, that they would do the same thing. They would, they would do the BMP thing and they would show uh, prospectively the, what they think they're gonna be using, how much water they're gonna reuse, how many trucks they're gonna take off the road, and then do a report every six months or whatever along those lines. So that's where my head was going with this. And so um, I think that I'm in concert with where you are, um, Commissioner Messner. Um, and I think it really is a, um, from my perspective, that is reasonable and necessary approach to regulating um, in a manner that is adjusting and showing that the West Slope, they're doing some good things there and we want to keep to encourage that. Commissioner Nanjapa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I appreciate your comments and, and those of Commissioner Messner. I think um, I'm generally in agreement with the direction you're going. And I, I really like the uh, making that nexus to the um, to the 905 uh, portions on, on water reuse and recycling. Um, there were a couple of parties that mentioned about water treatment facilities and how they treat the water, removing hydrocarbons before it even goes into the pit. Um, and I was wondering if, if staff could comment on the sort of the prevalence of that and maybe that's another um, option here with respect to um, some of the things that that uh, Chairman Robbins was just alluding to in terms of you know looking at the overall cost benefit of the pits. Director Murphy. Thank you Commissioner McGowan. I think that um, I think that's kind of the design of the pit. And as we think about the peon space and being a gas basin, the idea is to pull off as much of that gas as you can because that's a, what you're producing for as compared to a predominantly oil-based play um, where gas is not the primary objective. And so um, with that, I would also ask Alex maybe to chime in if he has more color, but it, um, I think that is part of the, drive in terms of development of the of the resource too. Mr. Fisher, if you want to, if you have Fisher, anything to add. Do you want to weigh in on that? I had to find the unmute button, sorry. Um, yes, uh, there, there, there is, uh, if, if you will, some, um, some at some of these uh, facilities, some pre-treatment where uh, the, perhaps the fluids will run through uh, a, a gum barrel and, and such uh, prior to uh, entering the pits, which uh, will remove uh, some of the um, solid sediments, if you will, as well as uh, uh, some of the lighter end hydrocarbons that have been entrained with the fluids. Commissioner, I'll drop a follow up and then Commissioner Putnam. Um, yeah, just uh, with respect to the follow up, so it sounds like that's mostly something that is in the used in the peons, and as you mentioned, because of that's you know primarily where they're producing gas, or is it? I, I was just kind of curious, sort of the prevalence of those water treatment facilities. I mean, is this something we could? suggest in guidance as a way to 
um, as a condition of approval for a pit. Sorry, Commissioner Najab, I think I misunderstood your question when I first answered it. Um, in terms of what is the prevalence, and is is that a common practice on the um, front front range? And I think some of this really stems from whether there's a produced water pit in use at all. And so I was framing my answer in the context of there is a produced water pit and how is water being dealt with before it um, goes into comes out of that pit. Um, I don't know, Mr. Leonard, do you have other thoughts? Um, I mean, I, I just think of this so much as like a Westlake issue. I'm, I'm struggling a bit. So, um, I think I think Mr. Fisher can can talk to the centralized waste management facilities like this because he's the he's the main point uh, at COGCC to permit these. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, Alex Fisher. Um, so, <laughs> So, uh, for the most part, uh, the centralized DNP uh, uh, management facilities where they're using large pits uh, is, uh, you know, for the uh, um, fluid uh, uh, storage and uh, dispersion uh, to the uh, frac sites. Um, the, on the western slope, uh, they're typically they are typically the pits. Um, in the on the uh, eastern side of things, uh, they have uh, constructed uh, uh, facilities where the fluids are contained in tanks and vessels, um, and uh, uh, they also use the uh, heater treaters uh, to skim. Uh, uh, vessels, uh, which uh, helps uh, treat the fluids. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mr. Fisher and, and Director Murphy. Um, so the last thing that, uh, you know, I, I just was sort of pondering and, and would be curious for staff's um, thoughts is, um, you know, we've talked about a couple of different things that we might want to encourage, especially in the non-attainment zones. Um, so I guess maybe the first part of the question is, um, do we, are some of these pits in what we know to be non-attainment zones and are there, is there potential there then to seek compensatory mit mitigation? Um, so if they can't achieve these levels um, that we're requesting um, for emissions, could they help with, you know, um, other reclamation, you know, of, of orphan wells or of, uh, you know, older pits that may have been buried, you know, and, and those types of things. I'm just kind of curious if, if there's been any thought or discussion on that. AAG Minor, I see you have unmuted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, so as you heard from um, Mr. Fisher and, and Director Murphy and, and Mr. Leonard, Pits are relatively uncommon um, in, in the DJ Basin, which is roughly the same as the non-attainment area. Um, so it's, they are less common. Um, certainly the commission could require some form of compensatory mitigation of, of closing a pit or, or finding other ways to reduce its emission as a condition of approval for uh, an OGDP or, or sort of other times when that's appropriate. Um, I think you heard Mr. Wackerlin yesterday discuss the Clean Air Act's provisions on compensatory mitigation and those, um, th there are offset ratios that apply um, depending on the level of, um, of non-attainment area that an area is, is classified as. I, I think it's, Commissioner Putnam would know this better than I do, but it, it ramps up from about one to one to I think one to three ratios. Um, I think we're at a one to 1.2 ratio with our current classification. Um, so there, there could, that's long way of saying that there could be some forms of compensatory mitigation already required in the source of seeking a new permit or at least a permit for a large enough facility that qualifies as a major source under the Clean Air Act um, in, the, in the front range. Um, but that independent of that, the commission could still, I think require some sort of offset of emissions from existing pits um, as a condition of approval on a new permit, um, though again, they're relatively rare in the non-attainment area. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that, uh, AG Minor, and and um, yeah, that makes sense. That um, you know we don't have 
we don't have pits in the, in the non-attainment area per se, but um, I am still wondering, and, and sort of apart from the whole offset idea, and I'll just you know, leave it for um, additional uh, discussion or, or um, any, anything further from the staff, but um, if we can do some sort of, um, if we could offer some other forms of mitigation that would you know, more broadly kind of help reduce our overall emissions, um, you know, by things like, you know, helping uh, reclaim with, you know, helping reclaim uh, orphan wells um, or, you know, other reclamation type projects that would help kind of the overall emissions picture. Um, so I'm just kind of thinking out loud about those things and um, I can, I can leave it there, but if anybody has any thoughts, I'd be happy to hear from them. Thank you, Commissioner Nanjapa. Commissioner Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just wanted to tie up a few loose ends here, I think mostly in response to comments so far. Um, AAG minor is correct uh, on the 1.2 to 1 ratio under the Clean Air Act, so um, gold star uh, for AAG minor. Um, essentially, the way that works is if there is a major source, um, which is currently um, 50 tons per year or greater, um, they would need to provide a compensatory offset um, of VOC and NOx emissions in the non-attainment area. The Clean Air Act currently limits that just to um, uh, the, the ozone non-attainment area. Um, if we are downgraded to severe, um, which is quite possible and maybe probable um, and could occur, occur within about a year uh, or a little more than a year, um, that ratio would go to 1.3 to 1, um, and the threshold for major sources would move from 50 tons per year to 25 tons per year, so it would bring in more facilities, as well as major adjustments to existing facilities um, that, that meets a certain threshold for um, major modifications to those facilities. I think also going back, and I think it was Commissioner Nanjapa's questions about some of those technologies, in addition to those that were identified by staff, th there are a number that have been identified as regionally available control technology, as well as the higher levels that I think we talked about yesterday, uh, best available uh, control technologies or lowest emissions, uh, achievable emissions rates. Um, and uh, APCD staff could work with your staff to help identify um, what some of those technologies are. They won't necessarily pull everything. They're not going to be as comprehensive as a tanked system, which is why certainly in the non-attainment area, our approach has been moving towards full containment and therefore full control um, of those emissions given the critical role that VOCs play in forming ozone. Um, here on the front range, as well as the fact that there's just more VOC in the produced water um, on the front range because of the higher oil content as opposed to the more natural gas, dry gas um, that you'd see in Piots. So those are things that, you know, staff can work together um, to try to nail down to make sure that there are appropriate um, mitigation measures and I think would need to be part of the um, consideration in the cumulative impact plans that are required um, in the 300 series to make sure that we're, you know, getting those controls both through um, the OGDP as well as through CDPHE permitting. Thank you, Commissioner Putnam. Always good to have you with us um, to help us with those sorts of things. Um, do others have thoughts, comments? Commissioner Gonzalez, you've been quiet on this front. Do you want to weigh in? I'm just going to pick on you. Nope. Yep. Happy to be picked on. Um, I, I, I don't have anything to add. I've been appreciating the conversation going on. Um, I, I appreciate the really addressing the, the idea and the limitation that was expressed by industry about the potential elimination of recycling options, reuse options, and, and, and I like where this rule is being developed um, to address those as, as part of the exception. Um, and I also appreciate the, uh, you know, tying its non-attainment zones and, um, and really, you know, being more surgical with the way we address the problems that are coming off of uh, 
or that are associated with the VOCs potentially coming off of these pits. So that's kind of where I sit. Haven't had anything to add on this in this regard. So I'll go back on unmute until I do. <laughs> Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Commissioner Gonzalez. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, um, I think I'm still struggling with if you're, if you're more than five tons that we would just require um, best practices or reasonable available control technology only if you're in the non-attainment area. I guess I feel like if our goal is to overall help um, reduce emissions that if you're going to build a new pit that we would, we would require that you're using. And Commissioner Putnam, I think that you were gonna to try to get back to me as to whether or not BACT actually existed for pits. Um, and since you're still using RACT language, so reasonable available control technology instead of BEST, maybe it doesn't actually exist for this type of infrastructure. Um, so I, I'm, I, I know that the pits in some instances are important and provide various different kinds of benefits, but I also think we should be working on minimizing as best possible VOC emissions from these. There, I mean, some of these are significant and large, and if folks are worried about they need more than five tons, if they you know kind of seemed upset about it during testimony, then I think we should require them to reduce those emissions as much as possible, regardless of whether they're in a, the attainment area or the non-attainment. Commissioner, uh, I don't know who was first, Putnam or Messner. I'll let you two find oh, Messner. Out. Messner, you're up. Okay. Um, so just to just to reiterate, I think uh, maybe I wasn't clear, but my suggestion is that within the non-attainment area, that we do limit VOC emissions from pits to two tons per year within 2000 feet of a building unit or outdoor designated outdoor space. That's not the right word, but. D-O-A-A. -A. Yeah, right. Um, activity area. And, uh, and that outside of that 2000 feet from buildings or D-O-A-A, -A, it would be five tons per year across the state, except in instances where in association with 905A3, there's the development of a um, reuse and recycle plan to utilize the water from that pit um, for recycling or reuse tied to uh, a centralized um, water distribution system utilizing the best available technology available in that instance. And in that instance, they would have the ability to have uh, higher than five tons per year VOC emissions, but only in that instance. So every other pit that did not reuse, recycle the water or tied to a, a uh, centralized water distribution system would be limited to the five tons per year. Unless you're in the non-attainment area and you're closer than 2,000 feet from a home or a DOAA, then you would be limited to two tons per year. So that's, that's kind of where I was coming at. I'm not saying that's the right answer, but that's what I was saying. So, Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Commissioner Mester. That cleared things up for me. It was starting to get a little complicated and I think I got lost along the way. So are you saying that um, you're interested in the 2000 foot setback, so to speak, um, only in the non-attainment area? Well, that's a good question. Um, I guess I was saying five tons per year, um, everywhere else in the state except for the non-attainment area. Yes, that is correct, yeah. But um, I maybe would like to turn to staff, but I thought that the two tons per year 
close to buildings was almost more of a more of an odor issue as opposed to a VOC concern. But maybe I'm completely wrong. If I may chair the um so the two tons per year within two thousand feet is proposed in nine oh three D six A and would apply um Everywhere. to existing pits within 2,000 feet of a building unit, whether it's in 2,000 feet of a, an existing building unit, sorry, whether today it's within 2,000 feet of a building unit or if a building unit is constructed within 2,000 feet of it in 10 years from now, it would have to come into that two tons per year limit, right? And that, that has created a lot of concern. Um, and so, if we then talk about 903D6B, which is the five tons per year VOC limit, that would only apply to new pits, not existing, as staff has proposed. I, I hear something different from what Commissioner Mesner has articulated on the five tons per year. Um, and can I ask a follow-up question? Can I, yeah, one more thing I wanted to come back to. Staff's concern with pit emissions has always been VOCs. Okay. And when you said the two tons per year to building unit, I thought I heard a lot of consternation that if a home is built close to a pit, that that creates kind of a, that creates a problem that was creating a lot of consternation. Did, did I hear that right? Yes. Yes. Commissioner Gonzalez. Yeah, I think uh, just to piggyback on that, I think another point of consternation was um, was the if someone's already within 1320, regardless of, of, of whether or not a home's built there or not, um, they've already retrofitted to get down to five VOC or five tons per year, and and to retrofit to get down further to two tons per year could jeopardize their ability to continue using their pit. Um, and so that's kind of the second point um, to piggyback on on what Chair Robbins just just brought up there. Commissioner McGowan. Sorry, now I have a clarifying question. If the pit exists first and someone builds something next to the pit, is the pit grandfathered in? Commissioner McGowan, under 903D6A, as staff has proposed, no. but we could go there if I, we Yes, go I think that I would like for us to contemplate that because I'm, I, it doesn't seem to me that that's the fault of the pit owner, but the, build, the person decided to build a building within whatever setback we settle on. Commissioner Putnam. Thank you. I uh, actually just wanted to um, respond to Commissioner McGowan's question about best available control technologies or other enhanced, those technologies do exist. Um, you know, the reasonably available is tied to a kind of a cost metric. The others are, are more feasibility or practicability base. And there are those technologies would probably need to bring on our oil and gas unit folks to kind of walk through what all those technologies um, will look like. I think Mr. Fisher had noted that heater treaters are one of the methods to try to pull out the hydrocarbon before the water is discharged into pits. Um, and you know we can walk through some of those pieces. Those I think should be captured for certainly for new facilities and the cumulative uh, impact pack plans and the types of BMPs that we would expect to see uh, on that. But um, you know I do think it's worth some additional consideration at staff level just to make sure that we're going to capture what we want to see in terms of the emissions control technologies as well as make sure the language is aligning with some of those pieces in 6b for example there's discussion about uncontrolled actual vocs as opposed to the ultimate controlled value and you know some of that could probably use a little bit of fine tuning commissioner messner Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I wonder if I could make a recommendation. I mean, I think there's been some ideas thrown out. We've chewed on this a little bit, um, but this probably needs a, um, a pass through some stakeholders, 
some staff and, and, and try to chew on some of this stuff um, a little further. And like with uh, the uh, previous 903, um, maybe come up with some draft language that we could then deliberate on again. Uh, what, what are folks' thoughts on that? Well, I guess I would ask Director Murphy, do, do you feel you've gotten enough direction to, to go with this or do we need to provide some more precise direction on a couple of the elements that we've been talking about? I, um, I certainly have, I think, some insights into what you all are thinking. Um, but I don't have, you know, as concrete of direction to know that what I come back with will necessarily meet your objectives, right? It will certainly further the conversation. I would say that I've heard concern about the application of a, an emissions limit on a pit because a building unit was constructed near the pit. So a kind of a concern about that 903D6A language. Um, I have heard that we should be considering emissions and more stringent emissions in a non-attainment area and that we should be looking to ensure that if a produced water pit in particular is tied to other important benefits for lack of a better word or um, that we would want to, if, uh, if a demonstration was made, um, we would be willing to consider not applying the emissions limit to it. And I'm sorry, I'm kind of working through this very slowly, but I'm trying to be fairly precise about what I've heard. And if that is, those are kind of the, the three big picture policy objectives that the commissioners are comfortable giving staff the latitude to implement, I can come back with something and I hope it, you know, aligns with ultimately what you all want to see, or at least it's more, it's closer to that. Um, but those are the three things that I've heard. I think, you, I think there was also at least two of us that were interested in not punishing the pit who had a home move in closer. Yep. The, yeah, the, rec, the, um, the retroactivity piece. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Nanjapa? I think I'm, I'm feeling good about generally, you know, uh, where we're going and, and the summary that you just provided, um, Director Murphy. Um, I'm wondering, or I would just throw out that perhaps um, as part of revising um, 6A there, we could um, maybe be more um, specific about new pits um, that would not be, new pits would not be located in a non-attainment area, nor within 2,000 feet of a building unit. Um, so for new pits, you know, they're being constructed. So that, of course, still does not preclu preclude a decision by the surface, um, by the uh, land use decisions that would put in a house later um, or, or other building unit. Um, yeah, I think that was, that was just the only other other piece there um, and then with all the other bits that you connected I think we're may I make sure I understand and the kids what you would recommend Commissioner Njapa is that there are no new pits within a non-attainment area period nor within 2,000 feet of a, of a building unit new pits um, and so then we're sort of removing that retroactivity piece which is kind of in line with how we've ended up um, with our, our setbacks in general um, for new uh, oil and gas locations, um, understanding that it's not the decision, our decision, nor the operator's decision that another building unit goes in at a closer distance. Um, and then, but I think, and with, with that, um, that maybe we keep the two ton per year in those situations um, 
but yeah, I would agree with, with some of the comments that have been made about the, the uh, retroactive pieces um, related to that. So I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with that commissioner, if I can follow up or sorry, I should let other commissioners talk. Okay. No, go ahead, Director Murphy, and then we'll go to Commissioner McGowan. Okay, so for pit, no new pits within the non-attainment area or 2,000 feet of a building unit. If there are existing pits within 2,000 feet of a building unit or the non-attainment area, those pits would need to meet the two tons per year VOC emissions limit. Is that correct? Well, I'll, I'll let other commissioners discuss that. I, I was suggesting that would only still apply for the new for a new pit going in, um, not re retroactive. So for new pits only, they would they could not be constructed near to uh, within two thousand feet of a building unit or DOAA, um, and would have to meet the two ton per year limit for a new pit. For um, and, and then the other piece that I added was uh, and would not be located in a non-attainment area uh, per what AAG Miner said before that sounds like that is not likely in the first place. Um, but, you know, if if those areas change in the future, it probably would be a good thing to have. So instead of staff's proposed five tons per year limit on new pits, you would propose two tons per year. No, I'm sorry, I'm not tracking this at all. Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, thank I'm sorry, you. Commissioner McGowan may have been yeah. there first. Next. So I, I'm, I'm with Director Murphy. I think I'm getting, I'm getting a little confused. So Commissioner Nanjapa, your, your proposal, no new pits within 2,000 feet of a building unit, or um, a designated. Sorry, what do we call that? Area. Designated outdoor activity area. Thank you. My rules moved on my other computer. Um, your your proposal is a little different than what Commissioner Messner put on the table, which was um, he was still allowing, I think, two tons per year in the non-attainment area. And I think what I hear you saying is no, no, no pits, no new pits in the non-attainment area. Is that correct? Thank you, Commissioner McGowan. I, I, I was suggesting that, although I am open to continuing the discussion here, I think, and also just to clarify for Director Murphy, I, I was also suggesting that the, um, with new pits that perhaps we could be a little tighter because for retroactive pits, we would need to be a little bit looser. Um, so that was kind of where I was going with that. Commissioner Gonzalez, or uh, Commissioner McGowan, uh, follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, then I'm trying to figure out what happens with the five tons and new pits that might be larger. Are we allowing th those outside of the non-attainment area, but with um, a recycling and reuse plan and, and best available control technology? Commissioner, yep. AAG minor. I wonder if Commissioner McGowan, you could just say that again so we can get good notes on it. It sounded so good and now, okay. So if I, if I, I think the new proposal, which is slightly different than Commissioner Messner's is no new pits within 2000 feet, no new pits in the non-attainment area, pits outside of the non-attainment area, would be allowed, but we would require a reuse recycling plan for their water, as well as best available control technology they'd have to show us that they're using, if I'm understanding the new proposal. Commissioner Messner. So Commissioner Gonzalez, if you wanna go, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to clear up some things uh, just as this is getting developed. Um, it, what I heard is it, it, pretty much well captured here. Um, and then the two tons per year for new pits would apply everywhere 
including non-attainment zones and that there would be no differentiation for new, new pits and non-attainment zones. Um, so basically if a new pit's constructed, it's on the, it's on the, um, the two tons per year um, limit without regard to non-attainment zones. Um, if, and then no new pits within 2,000 feet of uh, building units or designated outdoor activity areas. People are, people are nodding, people are shaking their heads. Uh, so I think they, I think Commissioner Nanjapa, uh, she can speak for herself, I'm sorry. Um, go ahead, Commissioner Nanjapa. Thank you, Ms. Commissioner McGowan. I'm sure you would do an excellent job. I, I yes, um, Bill, that was what, at least what I am proposing is, um, that all new pits would have to um, would would need to stay within that two tons per year, and uh, would not be located uh, within two thousand feet of a building unit or designated outside activity area. I did add the piece of no new pits in a non-attainment area. Um, and again, I'll leave that open for deliberation amongst all of you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think otherwise what others have said, I'm, I'm in agreement. Commissioner Messner beat you by hair, Commissioner Gonzalez. All right. Um, so I think based on testimony, Commissioner Nanjapa, what you're suggesting is no new pits, period because I think that what has been indicated in testimony at least is that it's um, incredibly difficult to meet the two tons per year emissions. Um, and so it would just mean no pits. And, you know, I, 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 and, and if that's the intent, I, uh, I appreciate where uh, your thoughts on that, but, um, you know, I'm gonna have a hard time supporting that because I do think uh, there are benefits to pits in different parts of the state and that so I'll go back to what I suggested which was um, two tons per year in non-attainment areas within 2,000 feet of homes or building units or DOAAs five tons per year in any pit statewide um, and, um, and then the provisions for recycle reuse, um, with best available, uh, control technologies, um, and tied to central, um, water distribution systems utilizing the, uh, the, oh, I lost it now, but the, the reuse and recycle section 90953 A3. Um, because I think in my mind what that does is it does address um, concerns in the non-attainment area and it addresses concerns um, for impacts to homes and or building units and um, and uh, designated outdoor areas. It does uh, address the non-attainment area and have lower limitations within the non-attainment area, but it also, uh, and, and it overall reduces tons per year emissions of VOCs statewide, but it still creates um, uh, the ability to have pits in areas of the state where that's um, beneficial. Understanding that you know, these that I'm still trying to encourage ultimately recycle and reuse of water, not just in the Peons Basin, but across the state. And so my expectation is that, you know, hopefully this reuse recycle incentives uh, and plans would not just be limited to the Peons Basin, but uh, would be seen as beneficial and utilized across the state. May I respond, Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, you know, I, I think that's a, those are good points um, with respect to the sort of um, expectation that if we went with what I was proposing, that may mean no new pits at all. Although 
Um, I guess I, I would amend then what I'm suggesting because I do really like your suggestion of connecting um, an application for a new pit with a reuse recycle plan. Um, so perhaps it would be something more like um, they would not be located within 2,000 feet of a building unit or designated out, outside activity area, um, nor in a non-attainment area unless there was a reuse recycle plan, but, but still keeping to that two ton per year limit. Um, so that's one piece. The second piece is what you were just suggesting. Were you saying that that would also then apply retroactively or just for new pits? Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you, Commissioner Nanjapa. So um, I'm suggesting that the, that it would be, um, and I'm trying to think of the impacts of, of what I'm going to say, because I, my, my suggestion would be that the 10 tons per year would apply um, retroactively um, and the two tons per year would apply retroactively. Um, but I'm trying to remember the testimony, whether that would be, um, whether that would have unintended consequences. But my understanding is, if I remember correctly, is the ones, the existing pits, particularly on the Western Slope that were utilizing water uh, for recycling, while they would not be able to necessarily meet the two tons per year limit, or perhaps even the five tons per year limit, it would apply they would be able to apply for a, a, a 905A3 um, reuse and recycle plan so that they would be able to continue to operate. Commissioner Putnam. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think at this point, I, I strongly suggest to my fellow commissioners that we might think about another focused effort with staff and stakeholders to really nail down some of this language. I think there's some definitional questions about what limits mean, are the two or five tons per year with the application of controls, without the application of controls, and there's somewhat different language, I think, between the way um, AQCC calculates some of that versus the way that um, is currently included with the um, uncontrolled actual language in the, the current draft or rules that we have in front of us. And I think that they can probably work through this in a way that will be consistent, I think, between the two agencies' considerations and work through some of the technical issues, knowing that I think the objective here is to minimize overall emissions, but also um, you know, see if there's a way we can accommodate some of the um, recycled water facilities, especially outside of the non-attainment area, um, where some of those, those big ones are going on right now. So um, just one suggestion, but I think that would make the most sense just so we're coming up with something that's really gonna um, hit all those objectives. Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'm in alignment with that. I just have, for myself, one thing to consider is I don't, I don't want people building a lot of smaller pits so that they can build a pit at two tons per year, but not have to implement, uh, for example, best available control technology. So for me, regardless of it's any new pit, I want, I guess, I want the gold standard of new pits when they get built. And so to me, regardless of whatever size we pick or in or outside the attainment area, we would want them controlling as best as possible emissions that are coming off the pits, and we want to encourage reuse and recycling of the water as much as possible.
Commissioner Messner and Commissioner Gonzalez. Well, I mean, I'm good with uh, Commissioner Putnam's suggestion to, you know, uh, run this through another, um, run this by some stakeholders, come up with some ideas and see if we can't get something that meets the intent. Commissioner Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, and I mean, I don't have any better ideas than what's been proposed here. And I think we've got some great ideas uh, to consider and for staff to work with stakeholders on. Um, I have a question on the first bullet point for the exceptions. Um, I just wanna be clear that those exceptions will apply to, or I, should I say, I'd like to um, clarify with, with my fellow commissioners and with staff that those exceptions apply to not only existing pits um, that would otherwise be required for retrofitting um, and also to new pits that may uh, seek an exception where there's going to be a net beneficial use and net beneficial impact um, where they may or may not be able to achieve the uh, VOC standards that we're considering here, even with best uh, available control technologies. Agreed. Yes. Thumbs up all the way around. Director Murphy. Um, I am, we are going to give it our best efforts and we'll look forward to working with stakeholders, um, parties response statements, and then the continued deliberation of the commission. Um, but hopefully we can flesh something out that furthers the conversation and allows you all to reach, reach the direction that you think is appropriate for Colorado. That's a long-winded way of saying, I hope we get it right um, and give us a little grace if we don't quite get there, but we'll keep working on it. Great. I'm going to unilaterally take us to 904. And there's, I'm just going to continue with my um, boldness and launch into 904. I think there are a lot of components here. Um, I, I worry about some of this getting really, really big um, for staff to be implementing in the midst of implementing um, some pretty significant permitting changes on the data side and revisiting all of our processes. And so this may result in me coming back to you in a couple of months and being like, dear commissioners, this is a great idea. Who's gonna help us do the work on it? Um, because I worry about overtaxing staff on some of these pieces and especially like, if you're getting into kind of deep analysis, um, I think that, I feel like I have very good guidance on 904B, by the way, I think I can clarify that based on the dialogue. Um, and would just say that, yeah, we'll do that as it comes to the 904A components. Um, I think I just, I just want us to think hard about how and who is responsible for compiling that information. Commissioner McGowan. Then Commissioner, Mr. Commissioner Pop. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, I'm gonna, um, I think Commissioner Putnam was the one who brought up, it could be something as simple as starting off with dashboards. So for wildlife habitat, for example, a CPW can help us figure out, you know, what's happening and what types of habitats and the acreage. Um, we could start hopefully maybe with a baseline and then some sort of cumulative impacts with a dash, just a simple dashboard every year. And then as we, as we get better at this, maybe it becomes more sophisticated. Um, and then I'm hoping, I, I feel like we, we talk about water quality, water quantity and reuse and recycling in many different places in the rules, but I don't feel confident that it's being collected somewhere centrally. And I don't know if CIDR has the capacity to do that or not. Um, and so I don't know if, if that's an avenue for us to create a dashboard around those kinds of issues as well. May I chair? Yes. I think, so 
Commissioner McGowan, I'm anxious about the word dashboard because building a dashboard to me requires IT and quantification and pulling in GIS. And I think I'm much more comfortable looking at what we're collecting on CIDR as it relates to wildlife, terrestrial habitat impacts. We are pulling that information into CIDR and using that to help drive it and looking at that overlay, I think within high priority habitat feels more achievable. And I, I haven't talked to staff about this, so I'm, I'm a little bit out on a limb. Um, I think with water quantity, you know, we have talked about that. I think that there are ways to probably pull in more precise data that would be more akin to the CIDR output that again feels implementable to me in terms of like going out to these different organizations that are either developing best technologies and like what does that report look like and how probing does that need to be um and what degree of analysis that and i'm sorry i'm i'm exposing a lot of my anxiety right now um but I think that the things that are metrics that we're pulling in through CIDR that we can pull in through CIDR feel very achievable and Im implementable to me. Um, and I think that there is a path to getting the water components into the CIDR database or in, in through a form five or five A in a way that we could distill it out similarly to what we've proposed for the other kind of four reporting metrics in 904. Commissioner Putnam. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you, Director Murphy. And um, as somebody who also understands those limitations of uh, metrics and dashboards and struggling with some of those same issues, uh, totally understand that. So uh, just throw out a few suggestions that I think can make this workable um, and working a little bit with some of the WRA suggestions that they had. One benefit we have now that you didn't have when you put out the original draft is that the AQCC did pass that resolution, which addresses, I think, a lot of the points that were um, in the WRA suggestion, maybe the majority of them. And so I think we can work some of that language in there. And we know that we, CDPHE and AQCC, are going to be working on those issues. So those are pieces that I think you may want to translate for this commission uh, or, you know, put, a, you know, a kind of um, COGCC interpretation on it, you know, within your particular piece, but the basic information will be there. You know, we will be reporting annually on, um, you know, how we're doing on the trajectory to the 1261 targets, um, you know, what forward looking for get forecasts are looking at those sorts of pieces. Um, I think um, going back to some suggestions that were made by um, La Plata County and San Miguel County and others on the kind of individual um, operators pieces. We are going to be getting that annual data um, through our Regulation 7 uh, amendments that went through and we can, you know, tie that. We're going to make that information available publicly and we can connect you with that information. So I think that's one. It doesn't make sense to reinvent wheels. Um, we have a challenge currently figuring out how to quickly pull all those reports together and put it in one cumulative sense that we're working at from our own IT perspective right now, but I think that's a solvable um, problem and you know that's whatever we come up with we'll share um, with you on that front. On the technology side, maybe one possibility, especially given that we have a professional board right now, is to borrow some of the things that, for example, um, the Public Utilities Commission will do, which is to have investigatory dockets where they solicit information and bring in experts from the outside um, to present on those issues. So maybe once a year, um, you can have a forum where you'll pull in from industry, from the research community, from APCD, and from others to present on what's the current state of technology There'll probably be some alignment and some disagreement on how ready for prime time particular technologies are, but really tap some of the expertise, interest, and um, passion there are, I think, on a lot of these issues. And then, you know, we can use that as a forum to talk about new research from the enterprise or from MeTech or others. I think that's probably something we can do without a deep and disruptive effect on staff. 
um, and happy to work with you on, you know, what that might look like and, you know, make that an open opportunity. So people can submit if there's a new technology or if there's a vendor or something, you know, they could present that information to the commission and the commission can wrestle with that every year and use that to inform, you know, do we need to change regulations? Do we need to check BMPs? All those other sort of things. Do we need more research? Um, and really provide a kind of continuous way of improving um, on those fronts. Similarly, we can, um, you know, have a presentation from the Water Quality Control Division, for example, on status of stream segments and um, other pieces. We provide some annual reports to the legislature on a variety of water, air, and other subjects, and we can make sure that you have uh, that information. So I think a lot of this is, is kind of a gap-filling exercise that a lot of this is out there and I don't think commission staff should reinvent the wheel on any of those things and it's just making sure we get you those things that are there and then what else do we need to do over time to fill those gaps and you know continuously build um, the understanding of the total cumulative impacts. Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is just a question for clarification. I think I heard someone um, say in testimony yesterday that the CDPHE, the commission's resolution might not align exactly with the greenhouse pollution reduction roadmap goals. Are they the same, Commissioner Putnam? I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page heading in the same direction. Commissioner Putnam. Yeah, so actually they do align perfectly in terms of the recommendation in the roadmap. I think the one, um, you know, footnote I'll, or asterisk I'll put out there right now is that the commission wanted to make sure that we heard from the public about comments on the greenhouse gas roadmap and those numbers before finalizing the precise numbers that are going to be in there. So that comment period will end on November 12th. The state will be considering those comments and then finalizing the roadmap. And then the commission will finalize the numbers in that resolution based on their expressed intent um, last week. And so it, I think that's um, a place where we'll take the asterisk off um, those numbers at that point which within the time frame we're talking about, I don't think will matter because we'll still be reporting against that um, next year. I think the other difference that's out there is that the original roadmap put out a scenario um, for how we might achieve reductions. It didn't show that it was the only way to get to those reductions. And the resolution I think is a kind of refined and interpreted version of that to say, this is what we think um, you know, will be the best path to hitting those targets. And therefore we're setting um, uh, more accountable targets to develop rules um, and other sort of policies around. And so um, you know, I think reflecting there can be different paths to the same goal when we're talking about different courses of reductions, there are some subtle differences in the different modeling approaches um, on how you might get to 2030. The resolution is designed to be a policy um, direction to say, this is how we intend to get there. Commissioner Bogue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is a question for Director Murphy. I think one of the stakeholders yesterday um, suggested that OGCC has a certain budget for our research. Um, can, is, is that true? Sorry if I missed yesterday the clarification on it. I'm just thinking about, um, you know, cumulative impacts analysis, how, how big of a lift that can be, um, especially around wildlife, obviously collaborating with CPW um, is key there, but, you know, are there opportunities to um, potentially bring in external consultants to do some of the analysis that um, OGCC potentially doesn't have capacity to do? Thank you for the question. Sorry. Go ahead, Director Murphy. Thank you for the question, Commissioner. And um, we do have two line items that are related to investigation, environmental investigation. Um, they're both fairly narrowly tailored um, in terms of what we're authorized to spend them on. 
Um, I have not asked our budget team to look at that piece in particular. And the other piece that I would flag is that um, consistent with what I told commissioners in July when we increase the mill levy, um, we're taking all appropriate steps to reduce spending right now and reducing spending from those line items is um, a component of that, um, recognizing that we're all tightening our belts right now. So um, it's hard for me to see a direct line to spending those dollars right now for a couple of reasons, but we, we do have two line items and I think it's about a half a million dollars in total. Mr. Duranlo, do you want to add to that? I can clarify the amount of the line items. Um, the legislature has, and, and thank you for the question, um, the legislature has um, provided $325,000 on an annual basis to do special projects. Um, originally, that was put in place, um, you know, really focused on groundwater investigations. Um, aquifer studies and aquifer characterizations and, and things like that. Um, the other budget is, the other line item is um, our environmental um, investigations budget, which is really, a, and complaint response is really designed to um, conduct work um, focused on, you know, water well complaints. Um, and that funds, uh, you know, a good amount of the work that the, um, the environmental unit does um, when we're responding to to complaints, and that is three hundred twelve thousand dollars and thirty three cents. Um, that said, when we put together our annual budget this year, we did restrict sort of self imposed restrictions on those on those budgets. Thank you, Mr. Duranlo. Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So going back to the other slide, Director Murphy, um, I mean, does does this still give you heartburn? This one's okay. We're okay kind of in here in this with these weekends as far as what, you know, may be possible there. Um, I wonder if we could fit in the, the technology. I mean, and I know that, uh, and I appreciate uh, Commissioner Putnam's comments on this because I think that was helpful. Um, and I'm sure CPW would, uh, well, I don't know, but I, I, I'm guessing that CPW would also be as um, particip participatory as the different entities within CDPHE as well. Um, but there was one suggestion in 904A to kind of talk about information on the technologies or uh, measures employed by the, the operators and kind of highlight those as a, you know, look at the good work these guys are doing. This may be opportunities. And, and that may tie into um, what Commissioner Putnam was saying as far as a forum goes, but um, I think trying to to bring that forward, I think, is an important thing as well. So, Commissioner Messner, maybe I can take that back to staff, and we can think through what what that could look like. Um, I don't. I think that. Um, I think, I think we can think about that. And I think it's good to keep everybody informed about what technology changes are advancing. Um, but I, I also wonder whether it's, if we are the right platform for identifying and in by perception, maybe advocating for those advances. It's a, it's a, it's a fine line to walk, but I think that understanding the status of technology is a good thing. Um, and especially new technologies um, and understanding how they can be deployed, recognizing they, there's never 
a single technology that solves every problem in every circumstance, right? Um, but I think that's something that I can take back to our team and think about a little bit how to flag it. I, I think the other component of that that I would encourage each of you to keep in mind is that starting in January, day in and day out, one of your jobs is looking at and evaluating permitting applications and the technology that supports those decisions. Um, I think you're going to be more in the weeds on those changes than, than even I realize right now. Um, No, that's fair enough. And so, I mean, yeah, I think that's fair enough. So I'll, I'll look for further thoughts on that later. Commissioner Gonzalez. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, you know, I think that when we think about what our, what our jobs are going to look like next year and, and how we're evaluating these permits and really getting into the weeds of what the actual operations look like, what different operators are doing, what different technologies they're employing or considering, um, you know, I think we're going to have the opportunity and, and, and I hope we leverage it, you know, to, to ask an operator, say, hey, I really like what you're doing, come up and highlight it for us, you know, come, come tell that story publicly um, so that, A, we can learn from it. Um, B, perhaps you can influence uh, other operators or, or, or at least maybe get them off high center if they're concerned uh, uh, about, about the application of some, some of those technologies. And then C, you know, it gives the operators a chance to toot their own horn and, and to get some kudos. And so, um, you know, whether that just happens um, annually at, at whatever this, you know, a QM Impact Summit or a CIDR Summit or something, um, or if it happens at, at our request, I, I think that could be an ongoing con conversation. And, um, and I think our, you know, if we had room on our hearing schedule, which I don't know if we will or we won't, um, that might be an additional platform um, for, for such kind of technological discussions. Anything else? Director Murphy. Thank you, Chair. I'm reviewing the list again um, of ideas that have come forward. I think a number of these, so I am in looking at this list recognizing that um, it may make sense to create some latitude for something or as otherwise directed by the commission, recognizing that you all are here to direct staff and to do these different things um, and not having that latitude we to have to have a rulemaking to go back and modify that annual report feels a little bit unnecessarily curtailing. And so when I think about, in particular, the recommendations on 904A2 from WRA about subsequent initiatives that are developed by CDPHE, we shouldn't have to have a rulemaking to be able to Im include that information in a report. And so does it make sense to create a bit of a catch-all um, category of, or as otherwise directed by the commission? And does that help? Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, no, I mean I, I'll, I'll chime in as, as one commissioner. Um, I, I think that helps. I think that that latitude's important um, for for all of us and and for and for staff in particular. Um, I'd also I don't I don't know if it's inappropriate to throw it out here, but you know, but what if the in in 904A um, just in that first line, you know, that last couple of words is changed and may include. Um, and then have that list, right? Because th this list just seems to be growing and growing and growing. I'm concerned about kind of trying to cap capture every circumstance that we're contemplating that may be relevant or important through this report. Um, and if you have maybe the may include, and here's more of the catch-all language, and then or as otherwise directed, it gives us the opportunity to 
include or exclude more or less pertinent things um, as, as, as kind of this report develops um, over time. Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do like the idea of uh, uh, as further directed by commission because I'm, I'm already envisioning myself being able to ask for a cumulative uh, analysis of depth of snow at different ski areas so that I can figure out where I'm going to be skiing the next year and all kinds of fun stuff. So, Commissioner Putnam. And I would also suggest building in flexibility that um, under the resolution, um, the intent is that the Air Pollution Control Division will deliver a report to other commissions, including COGCC, PUC. If it's covered by that, I'm not sure you need to do an independent one unless um, you know the commission sees value in going beyond that. Yep, I think that makes sense. Great. Anything further from commissioners on 904A? And 904B looks good too, I think. Well, um, we've, we've gotten four of our rules um, done today. Uh, it is four o'clock. Um, we have seven or eight more slides to go through and a lot of information. Um, do we want to keep plowing through it? Do we want to take a break? Do we want to contemplate what happens if we don't get done today? Do we want to plow into the evening and try to get it done? think maybe just some process questions real quick might make some sense. And I'm, I'm, I can do any of the above. Commissioner McGowan and Commissioner Najapa. I can, I can, I, I can work through tonight to get it done if, if we want to, um, but I am going to need a little break. Commissioner Najapa. Same. All right, well, um, why don't we take a, do you wanna say a 10 minute break and come back at 410 and then roll up our sleeves and try to roll, you know, get this done today and into the evening? Commissioner Bogue, you un unmuted. Did you have something? Yeah, just to let folks know, I have to jump to a GHG roadmap meeting now, um, but I will be back at five, so do not wait for me. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your work on this with us. Okay, so 410 we'll come back and then we'll plow through the rest of this today. Um, I think we have moved on to uh, rules 905 to 907. And looking at the slide, uh, the first is a shall evaluate opportunities for reuse and recycling. And for the life of me, I don't even know if I put that on the, on the slide deck or if someone else did. Commissioner Messner, thank you for. That was me. Um, so uh, 905A, um, it was a suggestion, oh, hang on. I'm in 903. Um, it was a suggestion to put the words um, operators shall evaluate opportunities for reuse and recycling uh, in, in that uh, first section. 
So in 905A, Three, it would be um, to insert the words to encourage and promote waste minimization. Operators shall evaluate opportunities for reuse and recycling and may propose uh, plans for managing EMP waste through beneficial use, use, reuse, and recycling by submitting a written management plan, blah, blah, blah. So it was just putting in that section for evaluating. And so that, to me, that makes a lot of sense. I'm in support of that, uh, so. What do others think? Commissioner uh, Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Commissioner Messner. Uh, I'm kind of, I'm reading that, that, uh, that rule right now with, with that language. And so if it's shall evaluate and then may propose plans, um, I'm curious how you, in, or how we, how we would enforce the shall evaluate. Like what, what, what's the deliverable in that evaluation? What's the expected deliverable? And um, you know, what's that staff gonna do about it when they get it? Mr. Chair? Yeah, go ahead. So in my mind, it would, it would be, uh, uh, it would be a narrative. So you're evaluating um, opportunities, you're doing an analysis, you're providing a narrative, and then it doesn't, it doesn't force you to do it. Now, I mean, I think I've at least proposed a modification of 905A3 to create opportunities to utilize a plan to gain additional benefits as far as potential VOC emissions. But, and so that may modify this section a little bit, but it, it just, it, it, it requires an analysis and it requires a narrative, it requires an initial step. And, and my hope would be in reading that, that it would perhaps encourage uh, the reuse and reutilization of water in a situation where maybe they didn't realize that, you know, a certain, whether it was possible or not. And I'm sure that they do. I mean, I'm sure they do an analysis anyway, but it's just a step to, to understand what opportunities may be available. Other commissioners with thoughts? Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think I'm aligned with Commissioner Gonzalez a little bit that maybe we need to provide some clarity around what that looks like and maybe it's something as simple as a form and it has key information that you know we want to see. Um, Commissioner Gonzalez, yes, sorry. Um, would would it would it be an appropriate um, box or or just kind of fill in on the two way um, or the OGDP um, basically? Do you plan on recycling, reusing water, um, and if not, why? Um, would that would that be an, an appropriate place for that information? And would that provide a beneficial use for that information for for staff and for for us as commission? Um, okay. AG Minor. Yep, AG Minor. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Gonzalez. I, maybe I, I can help set the stage of what we're talking about in, in 905A3. Um, so, so you as commissioners did adopt this as a, a plan for a, a Form 2A, right? So Rule 304C18 is a water plan um, that does identify multiple things, including if reused or recycled water is to be, is anticipated to be used, a description of the source, et cetera, and if fresh water is going to be used, why the operator did not use, um, reuse or recycle water. Um, so, so that is coming in on a 2A. What, what 905A3 is, is it's sort of creating the option for an operator to submit a form four, um, presumably at some ongoing or existing operation outside the 2A process that is a recycling and reuse plan. 
Um, so, so it's sort of an option to, to, to submit that plan, but that, that is sort of distinct from the, the permitting process that is governed by 304C18. And uh, I, I hope that helps a little bit. Um, Mr. Dromo could, could add more, I'm, I'm sure. Commissioner Gonzalez. Thank, thank you, AG Minor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, so, and so basically with the May proposed plans, that's essentially to provide support for, for their Form 4 sundry, um, for whatever they're asking for through that Form 4. Um, am, am I getting that right? I'm, just, I'm trying to understand the, the purpose here and get that dialed in. Okay, AG Minor or Mr. Duranlo. Thanks, Chair. Um, it, yeah, I mean, this, it, the May propose is, you know, and, and AG Minor is absolutely correct. It's ongoing operations where, um, you know, they may, maybe they're disposing of water. It's, it's all going to injection right now. And maybe they find, hey, here's a unique opportunity to start um, to start using that water in a different manner, or we have a limited need for use of water in a different manner, and so it's it's allowing them to propose that through, um, you know, through the form four process. Um, so this is this is beyond new well activity and new well drilling and completion activity. And Mr. Chair, if I may add one thing. Yes. Uh, it, it's also beyond water, and I, I didn't mean to sort of limit my statement to, to water. This, this is all forms of ENP waste. So this, an operator could propose um, a plan for recycling or reusing another form of ENP waste that is, is not water. Um, I, I suppose drill cuttings, for example, I'm, I'm sure Mr. Axelson or Mr. Dromo could provide other examples. With that, uh, Commissioner Messner. Well, let, let me just ask. I mean, uh, understanding that it's a form four, understanding that someone submitting that form four. Uh, I mean, it, do you feel like the shall is necessary in order to, you know, encourage the analysis of different options for reuse and recycling, or is that just inherent in? them submitting this form for that they understand the opportunities and are looking at perhaps pursuing them. If, if I may, Chair? Yep, Mr. I, I think that this rule was really in, in, intended to capture where the operator is proposing a reuse or recycling of waste. This is how they do it and this is the information they need to give to us. It's not putting a blanket over all operations and saying, now that you guys are doing, you know, operating, let's, each one of you needs to evaluate all of your waste streams and, and how you can reuse and recycle them. Does that answer your question, Commissioner? Commissioner Messner? Yes, and so with that, is it, I'm assuming that what you're indicating is that the inclusion, inclusion of the shall language wouldn't wouldn't be helpful. That's correct. Yep, that's what I'm thinking too. All right, so are we keeping it as is? Everybody comfortable with that? Okay. Commissioner Nanjapa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Assuming we're moving on to this next piece. Um, I think that was one that I think I raised, um, but as I'm looking at the sub items under number three, a lot of this is already covered. I think the only piece that is not covered is um, the amount transported or, or perhaps a method of transportation. I think that was those were a couple of things that were noted as we start to determine, you know, sort of how much is, how much of the waste is, you know, being moved elsewhere, um, you know, and what's, what's ultimately happening to it, but sort of that whole, you know, being able to sort of get a sense of what's happening along the way, I think is what was intended there. 
Um, so perhaps all we need to do is add, you know, method of waste transport treatment and storage in C, perhaps. I'm comfortable with that. Other commissioners? All right. We got thumbs up there, Director Murphy. Flip the page. All right, rules 908 to 910. Commissioner McGowan. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I, um, I, I want to, I want to be supportive of those pits that have water in it that is useful for wildlife use, um, ranching, watering, livestock, etc. But I don't think that all water and all the pits right now contain that kind of water. And so I'm, I, I. Um, in contemplating, I, I appreciate that staff is trying to accommodate that some of the water has important reuse value and um, perhaps shouldn't be netted or fenced because of who, um, what kind of wildlife is using it or for what purpose it could be used in addition to, sorry. Um, but I, I don't think there should be this kind of assumption that any existing pit is exempt from fencing or netting. And so I don't know if there's some other way for us to go about this other than to go back to the original language, which is you should be fenced or netted unless you've talked to CPW and they agree that the water quality is such that it would not be harmful to wildlife to use. Can you say that one more time? Um, that, that, the existing pits should be netted or fenced unless they've met with CPW and they agree that it's appropriate for wildlife use, that it doesn't need to be netted or fenced to protect wildlife. Ah. Commissioner Messner, I think you were next and then we'll come to Nanjapa. Sorry. I think it was actually Commissioner Nanjapa. I defer. Okay. Commissioner Nanjap. Thank you, Commissioner Messner. Um, I, I was just, I wanted to clarify because I, I understand where Commissioner McGowan is going, but I believe with the additional changes that staff showed us to the 1202 um, A, a uh, section, I can't remember which specific subsection that was, or there were some additional pieces that were added. Um, there was the provision of that allowed for existing pits to be fenced if that was recommended by CPW. Um, is that correct? I just wondered if maybe we could even flash that language back up on the screen and see if that addresses Commissioner McGowan's concern. Thanks. I had to read it several times last night and it Oh. Okay, here's our language. Commissioner Nanjapa, do you wanna work through that? Uh, sure, I can. You know, I think so, what we've done in both cases in the 909 and in the 1202 is take out the existing as a, you know, universal requirement, but with the addition of a, B, and C is, I mean, um, item uh, A4. So the, that, that whole section that starts with four is all part of 1202, 1202 A4, A, B, C, correct? Is that correct? Okay. So the F is 909, everything down below is 1202. Um, and then with, um, with B, 
there it provides the situation where CPW recognizes a need for fencing and netting in a certain site, site by site, um, or case by case basis, and um, and that allows for them to to make that requirement. Um, and and then of course the type of fencing and netting, et cetera, would be they would have to approve. Um, so I I will say I for one am, am comfortable with that, um, but would let others. Commissioner McGowan and then Commissioner. So sorry, this is my bad. Just I kept seeing existing crossed out and then assumed that everything under four applied only to new. So I'm good now that now that you've walked me through this, if this is what it really means. Sorry. I'm good too. Commissioner Messner, did you want to comment or were you? No, I'm good. Because I mean, I do, I, I do think that this covers it. I think that this gives the director the ability to um, determine that the installation is necessary. And um, one can assume that that would be based on, I mean, in my mind, it would be based on, you know, in uh, water quality uh, being a big one, so. Commissioner Putnam. How easy and quick that was? No, yep, we got come up, we got we got Putnam first, guys. I'm I'm not gonna make things difficult, I promise. I did have a question though on um the the language for existing pits, and it really is, I think, a workload question and a presumption question of do we want to put the burden on the director to identify those pits for which netting and exclusion should be added or should we create a presumption that it should be added unless um, someone makes a showing that they don't need it? If I may, Chair. Director Murphy. Um, staff proposed to carry forward the existing requirements around fencing and netting where it is a, a director level determination based on facts that come forward. Um, and I, I think that 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 is informed in part by the fact that many of these pits have been unnetted and fenced for a long time. And in, and for us to have to turn around and look at that decision for 3,000 pits kind of on a quick turn is, is a tough workload question. Um, I think we also have demonstrated um, there haven't, haven't been like an overwhelming demonstration that it's absolutely necessary. And I think the other piece that's really important to this entire conversation is gathering the um, data about the produced water quality going into it and reviewing that will give us a chance to look at that. And we do need to affirmatively look at that data coming in either way. So um, I, I tend to like the way we've structured it. Um, I think it also gives us more latitude to adapt if circumstances adapt, instead of kind of making a one-time determination that fencing and netting is not appropriate today in 2021, um, but something could come up in 2023 where we would want to go back and take a harder look at it. So I, I like the way we structured it and I'm fully advocating now, but I um, thought I would articulate that. And so you should. Thank you, Director Murphy. Commissioner Putnam, did you have follow up? Um, no, I think I, I just wanted to make sure everyone was comfortable with that presumption and the workload implications and appreciate that information. So thank you, Director Murphy. No, and I'm, I'm glad you walked us down that road. I think that made sense to look into it, but I agree with Director Murphy. Commissioner McGowan, did you want to weigh in? I'm, I'm good. I thought it was a great segue into the second question or clarification for testing in pits. Director Murphy or AAG Minor, do you want to weigh in on this question, um, obviously. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm actually going to kick it over to Mr. Axelson. I, I know that he and Dr. Gintaudis have been looking at this and, and spending most of the morning getting ready to um, respond to this question. Thank you, AAG Minor. Yeah, we have revised or have a proposed revision to that rule to require annual sampling for unlined pits. 
in sampling of line pits on a three-year basis, and then also providing operators a, a way to get out of the annual sampling um, if they show that the quality of the water is unchanged over a period of time. So that, that kind of sums it up quickly. Chairman, if I may follow up on that. Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Drama. So I, I, I think, you know, the details that John just gave are reflective of the fact that staff heard that concern, um, you know, that maybe a one, one and done sampling event on these um, was probably not going to be the direction the commission wanted us to take. Um, that said, we could certainly still leave it as a one and done event and, and, it, and our original proposal was one and done. Um, and then, um, well, I think I had another point and I think it's, it's already gone out of my small brain. So um, I'll, I'll leave it at that, that, you know, we did, we did come up with a, we worked to come up with a proposal that we were trying to, I guess, anticipate your direction. Do commissioners have thoughts? Commissioner Nanjapa? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and thank you, um, Mr. Dramo for, for that. And, um, Mr. Gintadas, or Dr. Gintadas, I think um, the, I like that you're increasing the, the sampling um, uh, because I, I do think that's important. And as it relates to the fencing and netting, I, I, I do believe we did get some comments that were primarily in the Raton Basin, you know, about new pits, I think there and whether those could be excluded. So I'm wondering if maybe there's sort of a water quality threshold or I'm just wondering, you know, how in the way the rules are currently written, um, would there be a way for some of those pits that have really good water quality from the outset, a new pit, um, could you know what would be what would be any um, circumstances where where they could be uh, accepted from that fencing and netting requirement, Mr. Drunla or mm -hmm. Mr. Miner? Yeah, I, I oh sure, Greg. If it's all right, maybe I can try to answer. Um, I think uh, so. It, the, it, Commissioner Njapa, you are correct that there is a fencing and netting requirement for new pits, um, um, which is a little bit separate from this 909J analysis, though certainly the 909J produced water sampling would in inform staff about what's in the pit, um, though that would of course happen presumably after the pit has been constructed and, and some of these questions would have to be answered if it's new. Um, I, I, I do want to emphasize though that 1202A still allows a CPW waiver um, for, for anything in 1202A, including A4. So if there really is no risk to wildlife based on the sort of characteristics of nearby pits and sort of an understanding that the groundwater um, near the new pit um, is generally very clean, um, then it might be appropriate for CPW to grant a waiver in that circumstance of the fencing and netting requirement of the, the new pit. Chairman Roberts, if I may. Oh, go ahead, Commissioner. Go ahead. Right. I, I just wanted to follow up on that, that, um, you know, we also have a new require or a requirement for new pits that is all new pits shall be lined. Um, so fencing is certainly appropriate when the pit is lined to protect uh, wildlife and livestock. And so, um, you know, I think those, you know, and I would say those rare cases where the operator says this water is of such um, you know, high quality and has such a high value that we want to both leave it unlined, we want to leave it unfenced and unheaded. I, I think that's an appropriate variance level decision. And I think that, that our rules shouldn't be defined by those more rare cases. Commissioner Nanjapa. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Duranlo. I, I That's helpful. I think the reason I was sort of raising that as it related to Jay is I was wondering if we would want to set some sort of, you know, water quality thresholds um, for when those would come into play. Um, 
but you know, I, I just want to generally recognize that I, I think it's a it's a good idea. You know, both the lining and the, the fencing and, and netting for the new pits, and and um, but also acknowledge that in those very rare instances where the water quality is really good, that can be really helpful for the wildlife in the area. So, um, trying to you know figure out how to balance that. But it sounds like with what we have and the discretion from CPW as well as the variance process, we seem to be well covered. So, okay, thank you. Are the commissioners in agreement or have comments? Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Jared. Uh, I, so, I mean, assuming as we're still talking about the, the section here, um, that included the staff suggestion that Mr. Axelson uh, had presented. Uh, and so I am in support of the annual sampling for unlined pits, sampling every three years for line pits and an off ramp from occurring sampling if quality demonstrated over X number of samples. I don't know what, what X should be. Um, and so, uh, but I think that this is a good idea. Um, and I would also concur that I think it is important to be able uh, for an operator to be able to show the need to not net um, new pits and perhaps even not line new pits um, when the water quality is of quality to not necessitate that. And so I'm okay utilizing the variance precedent uh, for the liner. I do think that there's a little bit of a problem there because we're requiring netting and lining. And so once you put a liner in, I have a hard time seeing that you wouldn't put a netting in. And so I guess I'm struggling to see how those two things tie together. And so maybe Mr. Dronlo, you can help me with that, but I don't see how CPW can accept a net if there's a liner. May I? Dr. Murphy. Thanks. So um, I think I'm going to start with, I don't think there are going to be, currently it doesn't look like there will be many wells drilled into a formation that has really high quality groundwater for a lot of reasons, starting with our well water integrity rules, right? We were really focused on pro protecting high quality groundwater. Um, and, and the CBM wells are really different very unique feature and so I think that we need to be focusing on the majority of what we see more times than not and I do agree with you Commissioner Mesner that if we're requiring liners we should be thinking hard about wildlife exclusion um, because of the concerns that have been articulated about what happens with the line pit and wildlife interactions and so I think again to kind of bring back to Greg's point which is we would need to really consider that on a case-by-case -case basis and CPW's viewpoint would be really important, but we have the tools in place to address those circumstances should they arise. Um, in terms of the X for the number of samples, I assume that our team wanted a little bit more time to think through what that number is because, I mean, when you think about sports, like two wins doesn't make a trend, right? Um, and I'm using sports because it's a fairly agnostic way to make that point. For the Broncos, um, it does. <laughs> I'm not gonna any I agree with you anyway so I, I think that's something that we'll come back to you with our recommendation on you can consider our recommendation in um, in if, if the direction is to develop this kind of more frequent sampling protocol um, we can come to you with that recommendation you'll hear from the parties about whether staff has gone totally off the rails and what we think we need to demonstrate um, consistency but um, I, I prefer how our rules are designed to require both lining and wildlife exclusion devices. And if we get to the point where we have some perfect water, um, we'll deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis. Commissioner Messner. No, that's good. Everybody okay with nodding of heads up and down? All right. Thank you to Mr. Axelson and uh, Mr. Duranlo and the good doctor for coming up with a solution for us here.
with that, I'll take us to the next sweet slide. Yes, please. Thank you. Do you want to lay the groundwork for this or does one commissioner want to claim the first item? Commissioner Gonzalez? I'm happy to claim the first item, uh, Chair. I, I, this was more of a, of, a, of a question of feasibility and current practice um, when I brought it up originally, and I think other commissioners had this same comment on their list as well. Um, so, so, I mean, I, I like the idea of, of, of the email notices, um, you know, transparency, open communication, all that. And I just want to make sure that, uh, that it's feasible, it's doable, it works within the staff's, um, uh, you know, ability uh, to, to, to do that. And if there's any limitations, that's just kind of what I want to hear. Director Murphy or someone from your staff? Mr. Chair, I think I can begin the answer by saying that uh, perhaps one of the people best positioned to respond to sort of the limits and um, not just the limits, but the opportunities provided by sort of the current IT capacity would actually be Ms. Stanzik, who we haven't heard from in a while, and I, I don't believe she's in the hearing right now. Um, so I, I think Ms. Larson could probably also speak to it. She, she is here, of course. Um, you know, as set up, the staff have created a system that provides automatic notice of hearing applications, um, which would include permit applications because OGDP applications are require a commission hearing. Um, th there is not sort of an equivalent opt-in notice provision for all other forms. Um, and, and so if, if you, you know, obviously I think you, you could see why someone might really want a, a spill notice, but figuring out who to send that to and how someone can opt in for that form 19, um, as well as really all of the other forms that the commission has. I mean, it's complicated enough coordinating that with local governments where we at least know what their jurisdictional boundaries are. Um, and so I, I'm sure Mr. Dronlow or, or Ms. Larson or, or Director Murphy could speak more to it, but it, it is staff's position that that sort of opt-in notice for forms that are not the really formal hearing application that come in through the e-filing system are a little bit beyond the IT capacity that we have right now. Mr. Dronlow? Yeah, Chairman, I would like to speak to this a little bit. Um, so on one note, I would, I would like to make it clear that our spill uh, reporting information, um, rule 912 does require that at the same time a form 19 is submitted to COGCC, the operator also notice the local government. So they do get spill notices and, and that would be in whatever sort of form that local government wants to receive them in. Um, but, you know, typically the operator is picking up the phone and they've got a call out list for, for, um, for those. Um, with a remediation project, I did hear several stakeholders um, suggesting that local governments would, would like the opportunity to, to consult on the remediation projects on the Form 27. And, and staff is definitely concerned that there is a, that that would, you know, delay the approval of a Form 27. We typically review and approve those in hours, if not a day or two. Um, our environmental protection specialists are, you know, watching their emails and those come in and we jump on them. We, we do not want to cause delays when it comes to cleaning up spills and releases to the environment. Um, and then, you know, I, I guess the last thing I would say is, is we do have the, the capabilities to provide, um, you know, an email notification when a uh, a form changes status in, in our system. Um, and my suggestion would be, uh, you know, a form 19 or 27, you know, ha having, a, having a notice, you know, go out when it gets approved so that the um, people who are interested in that would, would, would know that that work is, is going to happen. And that would be more akin to, you know, them seeing that, hey, some construction is going to go on. There's going to be a backhoe coming out here or an excavator and, and some truck traffic going through my municipality because an operator is, is working to clean up a spill. Thank you for that background. Mr. Dronlow, Commissioner Messner. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. John. Though I mean, I think that that's the type of stuff that's helpful. Um, I also wonder. So I mean, I, in my mind, and so I'm not talking about um, notice to local governments. Uh, I, I think what I'm hearing, at least, from folks are, uh, around the state is that they they just want to be able to opt in to be informed when different things happen. And I don't think it has to, I mean, I, I, I'm just speaking for myself, but, um, you know, I assume that when a spiller release happens at some point that information is uploaded onto our website because there is a database on the website where I can access that information. And at that point, it seems possible to be able to, you know, have a, and I'm, and I'm simplifying this, but a MailChimp account where people are opting in that an email goes out and says, there's been a change to the spill reports, or there's been a change to something else so that they're informed, should they be interested in knowing this information? Uh, and then they can sift through the, the emails that they receive as they, as they as they deem appropriate but i think that's what i'm thinking of so i'm not thinking about it as comprehensively as you know emergency notices going out in a certain time frame but rather what i'm hearing is is that people don't want to have to go to the website manually every day and dig through there to determine you know to find the information that they want if there was a possibility to be able to be um automatically informed with technology when there is a change to the data that's provided on the website as an opt-in type of situation. And so I'm not suggesting that it's easy or that we should, you know, that it's an immediate thing that we need to do, but I'm consistently hearing that this is something that folks are interested in. I think it's more of a procedural piece in, internally than it is a rule. And so I think this could be further discussed, but um, but I, these are, these are things that I'm, that I'm hearing about. If I may. Director Murphy. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Mesner, I agree with you. This question of how do we get information to people is something that we've heard resoundingly for a number of years. And it's something that we have responded to, I think, not at the pace at which folks have liked, but we have, we do kind of continue to work on that front and we still haven't really cracked this particular nut of how do I know what's going on in my neighborhood. We do have the daily activity bash dashboard, which helps you at least zoom in by um, municipality or local government, or at least count at the county level and see what's happened, you know, from day to day. In terms of um, kind of providing notice to people, I think it's important to keep in mind that we get one to two spill notices a day. Um, and so that, that's just a large volume of information and I'm not sure folks really appreciate the scale of emails that they might be signing up for if we can figure out how to do it. And so all of that to say, I think adding language to this SBP that I think is consistent with language we put in for 23600 that staff and the commission will continue to evaluate how to get information available to people in ways that are digestible or digestible is not quite the right word. Um, you know, we will keep looking at that and I think we'll keep dedicating resources to it because transparency is at the core of a lot of the things that we do. Um, we just are building out new tools with old databases. I mean, there's just, there's a lot, a lot to coordinate there. Um, so that would be my recommendation. And I think it makes a lot of sense to acknowledge in the SBP that this is, continues to be an important thing for us and for our stakeholders to look at. <laughs> I think what you're really trying to say is ways to not be overwhelmable. So, uh, AAG Minor, if, if you could weave overwhelmable into the statement and basis and purpose, it would be very much appreciated. So, are we through? The first two sub bullets at this point. Thank you. 
In my mind, we have addressed the first and second bullet points on this slide, but okay. Okay, and then I think the next one was the question around uh, soil gas or gas seeps or natural gas and groundwater. Um, in a, in, am I right? Is that what was next? And was that no? Commissioner Nanjapa. Thank you, Mr. Terry. Yeah, I think I, I put this one in, um, and this was related to uh, some of the industry concerns that um, if there was a release that they report that they would be considered responsible somehow. Um, and, and that's not specifically um, noted here, at least unless I, unless I missed it. But I, I did want to just kind of explore a little bit with how that would work, you know, so how we could encourage operators, regardless of who's responsible to report immediately so that we could, you know, it, you know, something can be done immediately, whether it's them and they get reimbursed for certain, you know, types of things that they can do um, until the responsible party is, is found, um, you know, and then obviously what we may, what the commission may have to do, but um, just wanting to get a little bit of clarity of, of how um, it's intended to work um, with the way these rules are written. Yeah, I remember that discussion. And I think that uh, whichever operator it was withdrew the request as long as there wasn't a tying up of responsible party with reporting. And so I don't know if that's something that can be done in this SBP. Um, Commissioner Gonzalez. Yeah, Chair, I, th I think I think you're getting to, to the right spot there. And I actually had something in my notes kind of written down and an idea um, is, is maybe something in the SBP where, where, where the language of the SBP stays, stays the way it is. And maybe a, an addition that says something that the reporting party isn't necessarily the responsible party. Um, and just kind of clearing it up that way. I don't know if that causes any confusion um, with the application to the rules, um, but if that gives some comfort to, to industry that, that just because they report something doesn't mean they're gonna be on the hook for all the costs and um, remediation associated with it, I think that, that might be a, a good middle ground clarification um, that I'll leave open for debate. Yeah, and the one thing I would just, and maybe AAG minor, if you could think about this, if you look at B1, on page 28, operator will submit an initial report of a spill or release of EMP waste, natural gas, or produced fluids that meet any of the following criteria. And then that's, these are some of the new criteria. Th that is sort of, that sort of the implication is that they're reporting something they did. But what came out in the testimony was there may be instances where they didn't do it, but they're aware of it. And so I, and I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but I mean, should we say we'll submit an initial report of waste, natural gas, or produced fluids that they are aware of and that meet any of the? Again, I think we can do this with the SBP as well, but um, I think that was what came out in the evidence is that sometimes they're reporting things that, that are not theirs, but they are aware of it, and we wanted to encourage the report. Commissioner Nanjapa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I completely agree with what you and, and Commissioner Gonzalez uh, said and suggested and, and perhaps maybe some clarifying language, um, definitely in the SBP, but maybe also uh, in the rule. There was another um, proposal uh, from, it was, so it was uh, PDC, Noble, and Oxy that were um, bringing these forward and they did withdrew, withdraw their suggestion for J, but they also wanted to delete G. Um, and I, I would like to get other commissioners view on that. I believe that that's also important to include um, regardless of whether or not you can quantify the spill. I think it would be really important to report any such um, incidents so that we can again get on top of it and minimize impacts. Thank you, Commissioner Najapa. And I guess I would point out that uh, subparagraphs E through J are all new requirements. And the paragraphs, I, if I got this right from my discussion with Mr. Axelson, A through D were previous language. Um, and it might be helpful to have Mr. Axelson speak to this because I know that 
um, some of this A or E through J are as a result of his over 14 year career with the commission and trying to uh, create a rule that is consistent with his practice as an environmental protection specialist. And I may be oversimplifying that, uh, John, but um, if you wanted to speak to that, or Mr. Miner, if you wanted to speak to that, we would welcome either of you. Mr. Chair, I will just open before it goes to Mr. Axelson with an apology, which is that staff did in fact intend to cover the, this 912B1G point in, in our closing yesterday. And due to a uh, technical error on my part, we accidentally omitted the slide from the closing presentation. So this is an issue that is really important to staff. And, and with that apology for not providing it as part of closing yesterday, I'll, I'll turn it over to Mr. Axelson. Yeah, Mr. Axelson. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, so I think the one that they were really worried about was the suspected or actual spill or release of any volume where the volume can't be determined and, and the daylights from the subsurface. So in our experience, these are generally very significant releases. So they're usually happening subsurface from a flow line or a dump line. It takes time and a significant volume of, of liquid to reach the surface. So even though only a, a gallon or two reach the surface, it, the cleanups become extensive. And, and we have seen examples where in the case of a flow line, an operator might discover the, the release, they respond to it, they, they don't think it's reportable, they do a quick excavation to try to repair the line, and now with the coordination they have to do with our flow line integrity group, you know, a lot of these come to our attention that way. And then we follow up on them and, and something that in the past would have just been backfilled and covered up, you know, we make them do more extensive uh, site characterization to clean up the, the spill and release. So to me, this is an important addition to our rules. Mr. Axelson, can I ask a follow-up question? Um, if you look at the language, and, and AAG Minor, this is a language question. If you look at the language, it says a suspected or actual spill or release of any volume where the volume cannot be immediately determined, comma, including a spill or release of any volume that daylights from the subsurface. So that actually contemplates two different subsets of spills and releases. One is a suspected or actual spill or release of any volume where the volume cannot be immediately determined. And then a second subset is including one that daylights from the subsurface. And I guess my question for you, Mr. Axelson, was, was this intent behind this to be the small daylighting of a large spill at all times? Or was the intent here to, in, to be any spill that you just don't know the volume of, including the daylighting one. Yes, I think originally we had this as two separate lines in this rule. So, and some stakeholders felt like there was too much overlap. So, so there is some overlap. I mean, you could have, you could have a spill or release where they, they find out, say, a subsurface piece of equipment has failed they know, know they're losing some fluid, but it hasn't daylighted yet. So in that case, we would want to be reported if they were aware of it. And also, most spills that daylight from the subsurface, it's really hard for them to determine the volume uh, at that point. Did, did that answer your question? It did. I just wanted to make sure that, that the draft captured the intent behind the thought product that got there. Uh, AAG minor, I'm, I'm stumbling. Yes. So Mr. Chair, I'll try to translate that into lawyer for you. So all we, we, this can almost be an, an, an LSAT question, but um, all spills that daylight to the surface are of indeterminate volume. If, if there is sufficiently large subsurface release that something is bubbling up to the surface, you can't tell just from being on the surface how big it is. Um, so, so that's why that we put the including there. However, not all spills of indeterminate volume are ones that daylight to the subsurface. Um, so, so that's why we, we included those in a two 
yeah, as we still haven't, they, they are two separate things, but one of them is sort of subsumed by the other, but we felt that it was important to specifically call them both out because they're, they're issues for different reasons. And um, I think in the past staff have not gotten spill reports that they would have liked to get for different reasons, right? So if an operator was un unable to determine if a spill met a sort of numeric volume, they might not have always tried to determine that before just cleaning it up and not reporting. Um, and then there's sort of a separate problem that when something gets to the surface and, and just a little bit is daylighting, we don't know how big it is. Um, so perhaps it wouldn't have gotten reported under the fairly numeric reporting threshold. So it, so it is important to call them both out in the rule, but it is correct that one category subsumes the other. Um, so Mr. Axelson can clean up the parts where I stop talking like a lawyer and more like a remediation specialist, but that, that is sort of the, the LSAT version of how those fit together. That is helpful. And um, I think between the two of you, you've done a good job of explaining this and Commissioner Messner has a comment or a question. No, I appreciate that. So as a non-lawyer, um, the way that I read it, and I just want to make sure again uh, that this is what you want, is that it basically, the first section of that just says, any spill has to be reported. Any spill. And the second part says, even subsurface spills have to be reported if they daylight. And so, I mean, I think what I hear you saying is that all subsurface spills need to be reported, as including ones that daylight. And so I, I guess I'm just trying to make sure that you, do, that you do mean that any spill needs to be reported, period. Because to me, that's what it says before the comma. Chairman, if I may? Yeah, Mr. Geronimo. So, uh, Commissioner Messner, I, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with with how with your read of that, um, it, it, because operators do have good means of determining volumes of spills, um, and I would say our that is our belief based on the volumes that are reported and the precision of the reporting accuracy on on some of the spill reports that we see. Um, so. This is, it's trying to capture spills that are close to the spill reporting threshold that the operator isn't sure and would rather have the opportunity to take that spill report in, review it, you know, provide oversight if necessary. Um, and, and, and then we also provided in 912E sort of an expedited closure for those spills that might, you know, that they reported under this, I wasn't sure how big it was, but I, I found out later that, you know, it was really only a 15 gallon spill. It just spread out, you know, and so it was, it was less than a barrel. And so we've got sort of an expedited closure for those. Thank you, I, Mr. Duranlo. Um, Mr. Messner, um, Perhaps could we hear from Mr. Miner and then we'll come back right back to you to finish up staff's thought on this pro project. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I want to kind of clarify another thing in response to Commissioner Mesner's point of is the, the purpose of G that, that all spills will be reported and, and the answer is no. So, so the, the quantitative reporting thresholds that you, that you see in subparts B through, through E apply. So if an operator knows that it is below those quantitative thresholds, the operator doesn't have to report the spill. You know, if, if something is literally in, in a barrel and it spills and it's less than one barrel, um, you know, that the operator would then know the volume of the spilled material and, and not need to report because it's below the spill volume. What, what G is dealing with is situations where the operator truly doesn't know the volume that was spilled and, and it might be above the threshold, it might be below the threshold. Um, and that lack of knowledge about what the threshold is, is what requires the spill to be reported. So it's not saying that every single spill is going to be reported, just that an operator's lack of knowledge about the volume does not preclude the operator from reporting it. Commissioner Messner and then Commissioner Gonzalez will turn to you. 
Uh, no, I appreciate that. I was okay with every spill being reported. I just want you to know that. But. <laughs> Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I don't know if staff wants every spill reported, if you're getting two a day already. Um, but uh, I think I, I, don't, I don't really have any qualms with it as written. Um, I, I, I get what the intent is. I think it's pretty clear. Um, there's, and, and I think the statement of basis and purpose attempts to make it very clear um, what the intent is here. And I think that, that, that language is very helpful. There's some particular language in there that, that I think um, I have some questions on, right? Or one piece of language, should I say. And uh, it's, if a spiller release is clearly and demonstrably of a lower volume um, than what's specified for the reportables, then the spill is not reportable. And I get that. What I, what, I, what I wanna get is, or what I wanna understand a little bit further is, is that if you don't know how big the spill is, how can you demonstrate that it is less than reportable volume? Um, and if you're wrong, what happens? I'll start, if I may, Mr. Chair, before turning it over to Mr. Axel Center, Mr. Dronlo, while they collect their thoughts and just say, I, I think Commissioner Gonzalez, um, the example I gave is an easy one where it would be demonstrably lower. So if a spill co comes out of a fluid container where the operator knows the volume of the fluid <coughs> container and it's less than one barrel, um, obviously that is demonstrably lower, right? Um, so, so I, I think that's sort of one example that might apply and then I'll, I'll let. Um... Thank you, AAG Minor. Mr. Axelson? Yes, Chairman, thanks. Yeah, Commissioner, so there, there's some examples and, and AAG Minor kind of touched on it, but one thing we don't want reported are housekeeping issues where we have, you know, small accumulations, say of oily waste over time, that, that might constitute, you know, obvious volumes less than one barrel or 10 cubic yards. Also, there, there are, you know, small upsets where, you know, the operator knows that that was less than half a barrel that came out of a tank. And so those clearly aren't reportable. Um, so I, I think those are the kinds of things that, that we're trying not to re have reported. Also the five barrel threshold where if it's completely contained in secondary containment, there were, you know, they don't, it hasn't actually created a release to the environment. So that's why we've maintained that five barrel threshold in secondary containment. So does that kind of answer your question? Uh, yeah, it, it does answer my question. Um, you know, I. I I think there's, there's, you know, it's not as precise as, as I think I would like it to be, as I think, um, you know, the, the the regulated community would like it to be. Um, I, I don't, I don't have a terrible amount of concerns. I think this is one that that I think needs to play out um, and, and see how it operates in practice. Um, and and kind of with that, as as one commissioner, um, I, I I don't have problems with it as written, and I don't feel like it's redundant, um, as, as perhaps one of the uh, industry groups had had noted um, against a uh, subsection one of that same uh, same rule. So that's where I stand. Mr. Chairman, one clarification. I just wanted to add that regardless of the size of the spill, they all have to be cleaned up according to our rules. That's all I had. Thank you. With that, should we touch, it seems like we've worked through a number of the 912B1 issues. Do we want to talk about gas seep reporting? Also, Walter wants to watch Moana. If anybody else would like to come over for popcorn later. And um, gas seep reporting, who wants to lead the discussion? Commissioner Nanjapa? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I think for me at least this is, it's within the same sort of overarching, you know, um, intent that we have here is, which is that, you know, we want to make sure that all spills or leaks or whatever are reported 
Um, and so, I mean, our, this is in reference to Jay, is that correct? Just making sure I'm understanding that the gas seep piece is, that's in reference to Jay. Um, it is, and Commissioner and Jeff, if we've already covered it by talking through the responsible party thing, that's fine. I, I'm kind of. I, I think so. I, you know, I'll, I'll let any other commissioner weigh in, but I, I think so. And I think just the biggest piece, as we already discussed, is just making that clarification about the responsible party. But um, you know, one other thing, you know, just in thinking about the SBP is, um, you know, just sort of linking that back to our uh, obligation under the law to protect public health, safety, welfare, et cetera, and, and that, you know, whoever, whoever finds it should report it regardless of who they are. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I think we're covered on that too um, with the responsible party and the finder's not necessarily the responsible party. We just want it found. So I think we, we're good there. Does that mean we're ready for our last slide? It does. All the joy. I can figure out how to get there. There we go. Um, so table, rule 915 and table 915-1. Do we want to hear from AAG Minor? Um, you sort of addressed this yesterday in closing. Um, I'm, you know, or, or we can start as one commissioner. I'm fine with table 915 and table 915-1 as drafted. Um, this is one of those areas in which I will defer to the experts of the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission um, and how they came to the numerals within the tables. Um, and uh, I would be comfortable in making no changes here. Chair, can I follow briefly? Yeah. Great. I think I think the commissioner raising the question about pathway to groundwater was kind of affirming that staff had committed to providing guidance on that, which we have. Um, the language around addressing language addressing the language in 915 E2C and the SBP, the narrowness of the exceptions is exactly what staff was thinking. Um, and and so I think at least on the first two, I, f I from staff's perspective, feel like we have guidance. Um, the last one, I think, was to make sure that we either had a conversation about the footnotes, um, but my recollection of the kind of comments around it was that the footnotes really address a number of the concerns raised by the parties. Um, so that's a indirect way of saying I'm not, I don't see a ton of issues here to discuss, but I don't want to foreclose anybody from making sure we really vet out the concerns and the issues raised in 915 and table 915-1 because they are really important components um, of cleanup and um, management of EMP waste when something goes wrong. Commissioner Najapa. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Director Murphy. Um, I, I just wanted to say that I really appreciated, especially the, the remarks that um, AG Minor made in closing about the expertise of the staff and the thoughtfulness that went into the, the development of the table and the, the, uh, the values and the um, evaluation of the you know, data that was out there about uh, why they landed on these numbers and and i feel very comfortable with how this is as it is i agree me as well I can't, I can't hear you, Mr. Chair, but I will take that as a picking on me and soliciting my input. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, the, the, the two things that, that I brought up in here were, were satisfactorily, satisfactorily addressed. So, we're good. Wow. Um, okay, so we have made it through the PowerPoint and we have received direction from staff and we provided direction back to staff, um, which brings us to the conclusion of our deliberations on 900 for the day. Um, I believe that we have this set up that we would adjourn until next week sometime. I don't have my, I don't have my uh, agenda in front of me to give staff a little time to 
work on revisions and red lines, and then we would receive that, I think it's Wednesday maybe at 10 a.m. Director Murphy? I believe that is what we calendared. I, um, these are very important rules and very important rule changes to so many of our parties. Um, I think staff would commit to getting them turned around by Tuesday morning if commissioners um, were willing to convene on Tuesday morning to give um, the parties and the stakeholders a little bit more time um, to work through the rules before closing, before their um, response statements. Fine with me. Are the rest of the commissioners okay on Tuesday morning? And then Director Murphy, I, I'm sorry, I totally do not have my agenda in front of me, so. Uh, oh, wait a minute, here it is. So, So if we reconvene on Tuesday at 10 a.m. November 3rd, we can get the staff presentation on the revised 900 series. And that would then give parties two days before we would reconvene on Thursday, November 5th to receive the party responses to the staff revised series. And then we would move into deliberations on Thursday, November 5th and Friday, November 6th. Is that right? Uh, Director Murphy and Hearings Manager Larson. That's that's what I understand from Director Murphy that we would move the Wednesday presentation to Tuesday, November third. And then Director Murphy, you would present that day, and we would all get the red lines, and then the commission could look at them, our parties could look at them. We'd have forty-eight hours before we would have the final hearing on the rules, get closing statements on thir Thursday, November 5th, and then um, move into final deliberations. Yes, Chair. Uh, uh, do commissioners have any concerns with this uh, slightly revised calendar? Looks like we're good all the way around. Um, Great. Um, well, I want to, uh, Commissioner Nanjapa, please. Sorry, just a quick question. Are we uh, intending to convene then at nine on Tuesday or was there an alternate time? It's totally up to Director Murphy. Um, ten, 10 sure felt lovely today. Um, even though it's probably why we're here at 520 instead of 420, but. Um, well, it, it should be a fairly short uh, hearing. We're just going to be receiving the red lines and listening to staff. So, um, I mean, I'm good either nine or 10. So, but if Director Murphy wants 10, let's go 10. Okay. Um, so, thank you uh, to commissioners, to staff, to our 91 parties that are still with us. Um, this has been a very important rulemaking. Um, I'm pretty proud on where we are. Um, and I look forward to getting the red line edits back from staff. And with that, we would look for a motion to adjourn this rulemaking to Tuesday, November 3rd at 10 a.m. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you all. See you on Tuesday. Go vote.